IoT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric. Navigating the complicated world of the Internet of Things is a tough prospect for companies yet to embrace new technology. But innovation in the energy sector is genuinely powering the digital economy. So how do energy companies, saddled with working practices of the past, innovate quickly enough to compete with the disruptors? Energy supply is changing to meet increasing demand with the decarbonisation of the sector and the increasing use of renewable energy, new industries and technologies are being developed to make more efficient use of the energy we use. The big change is the increasing role of the consumer generating their own energy, and that is driving growth. Competition in the energy sector is high, so in this programme we're focusing on how the big energy companies are adapting to the digital revolution. We'll find out what challenges they faced, what were the missteps, and above all, what are the opportunities that lie ahead? And how about the energy companies born in the digital age? What risks are they taking to stay ahead? I'll also be talking to the regulators who keep the energy conglomerates in check and find out what the future holds for the world of energy. Disruptive technology is shaking up the energy industry. It's driven by consumers, by regulation and by the innovators who develop it. In the Internet of Things where everything's connected, it's digital technology that's making the biggest impact in the most unlikely locations. Glasgow-based Matrix is owned by the energy giant E.ON. Matrix manages the energy consumption of many large companies such as supermarket operators where big savings can be made by switching equipment off during peak times and switching them back on when energy is cheaper. It's called demand-side response and it's saving companies lots of money. It's all part of E.ON's business strategy, headed by their chief digital officer, Matthew Timms. Great to meet you. Thanks for having us. He's been looking after E.ON's B2B offering since 2016. Yeah, so what we're seeing here is actually the consumption that are coming off of the buildings. And the team here then work with the customers to actually try and put in place uh, actions that they can take to actually improve the savings, uh, reduce the energy. It's a fantastic example of Internet of Things. The digital innovation is actually really, I suppose, more like a data or a machine learning, pulling all of the data out of the systems of our customers and then actually using that data to help them be more efficient. We work with a number of the, the larger supermarket chains in the UK. We're able to bring in all of the information, all of the data from the locations that they're present on the high street or maybe even off the high street and actually be able to see how those, those locations, those buildings are actually performing. Are the lights on in the building? Do the lights need to be on in the building? Can you turn off the lights? And you can actually do all of that type of thing centrally. And some customers we can save up to 40 uh, to 60 percent of their energy services and save them uh, producing more CO2, which obviously is harmful to the environment. So where does E.ON see the business opportunity in, in rolling out digital innovation? So we see it right across our business, actually. Um, we're applying digital in all areas of, uh, of our business. And ultimately, it's just about our business. It's about how can we engage better with our customers? How can we make our employees work more efficiently? How can we uh, deploy our assets in a better way? And we can also use digital to actually look at whole new business models, which is really where we come in with uh, things like Matrix, because Matrix is really a software business now. So we're actually delivering software to our customers to help them be more efficient. Now, Eon's a large company, but with stiff competition from up-and-coming disruptors. How have you adapted to the challenges that they have posed to you as a large organisation in a fast-changing market? When you move in a, into, into software and you're building new parts of your business out, the time to market nowadays has significantly decreased. So we as a company have to adapt to that. We have to build new skills in our business. We have to become far quicker in terms of delivering these type of, uh, these type of activities. So we keep our engineering heritage, our fantastic uh, security that we build into all of our products, as well as then actually trying to be more agile, more adaptive to the market. 
What might be holding you back while you're doing that? Because as you said, big organisation, legacy systems, legacy infrastructure in place. What we can do when we look at some of the new advances in technology is look at how we can also rebuild our existing uh, business with uh, digital at its heart so that it becomes really a more you know, digital first business, the way that we engage with our customers is, uh, is, is supported in a wholly different way. It's more, it's more of a radical approach to the way that, uh, that we can work. So um, yes, I think um, you know, we get a lot of opportunities for, for that um, within the business from digital. The US Energy Information Administration has predicted a 48% increase in global energy consumption by 2040. Securing that supply so we can keep the lights on has got a lot of people scratching their heads. But the answer could be microgrids, islands of power generation that can operate independently when national grids become vulnerable. Karen Morgan of Dynamic Energy Networks thinks microgrids are the future. Well, microgrids are discrete energy systems that can run in parallel or independent of the utility grid. The excitement around internet technology and internet innovation enables these microgrids to be deployed faster and transform the electricity markets. You're developing these microgrids, these platforms, sometimes in quite remote areas. It, right. it sounds like there's no one size fits all. We can't rely on the infrastructure of today. So we have to, we have to think about the opportunity to be independent of the grid whenever we can. We've had in the United States several incidences of security breaches in the utility markets. Well, what happens if, if there is a security breach in a utility? You have to be able to keep up and running. The cost of, of, your, of a business going down um, can impact the business significantly, not just in terms of revenue and profitability, but has in some cases taken companies out of business. So some of the technology that's very interesting that's underlying these microgrids enables us to do things like dispatch energy from my microgrid back to the utility grid. Why is that important? If you have two weeks of 105 degree weather in Texas and the utility grid is going to go down or they can't dispatch enough energy, they look to the microgrids or the independent grids to provide that energy. So it cre this interoperability among and between microgrids and with traditional grids enables us much more flexibility. For the end user, whether it's healthcare or institutional uh, campuses or other, um, it provides them with a long-term predictable price of their electricity, which allows them to manage their business better, provides them resiliency whenever they need it, provides them stability and security. And maintaining this new energy infrastructure so that it does give us the power we need when we want it is essential. Thankfully, there are new technology companies on hand to do just that. So right now we've got a remote pilot who's actually flying the drone and always looking at the drone. And we have an inspection engineer who's operating the camera. So the most important thing is the data, not the actual drone. So James Harrison is CEO of Sky Futures. They've been in business since 2009 and use drones to inspect energy infrastructure in all parts of the world. Initially, their focus was on the oil and gas sector, but now they're carrying out maintenance surveys on any vertical industrial infrastructure. So we work with large engineering firms that may work in renewables or oil and gas. And so we enable them to fly drones to collect visual, static and thermal data of those assets. We enable them to use software to extrapolate information from that so they can identify the anomalies, the cracks, the defects, and then to predict the maintenance schedules so they can be more efficient and run them better in the future. What is it about the digital innovation you're using that, that makes it different and unique? Because when you think about a, a drone, it, it's a tool, isn't it? It's not itself a, a smart um, device. They collect metadata, so they collect the GPS position of the drone, the angle of the camera, and a bunch of other things as well. And so what we do is we mesh that together with the video data, which makes it completely different from other items today. So this is a pretty fantastic 3D setup of one of your rigs, one of your drones would then have identified these, these spots. Talk us through what we can see. So here you can see there's a red dot, obviously that's a severe issue. You can simply, with the mouse, 
click on a high severity item here. It takes you straight to the bit you're interested in. So this is the flare tip. This is what it tells you the problem is. There's a short video associated with that problem and then a static image. You can click on the still photo and then you have it right in front of you. So it's really simple. Today we're doing kind of wrist-based analysis or wrist-based inspection. So you say, last time we looked at that oil rig, you know, the, there was a crack, it was this big. We think, according to engineering theory, we need to go back in three months' time. You've taken one data point in, in space and time. What if you said, what about the last 10 instances of the same problem? You can then predict what it's going to look like in the future. So it actually changes the whole maintenance life cycle. When you're spending hundreds of millions maintaining an oil and gas rig, if you can tweak it by 20%, they're very, very big savings. The energy sector is undergoing fundamental changes to the way it operates. And those changes are being driven by the digital innovation that's sweeping through all industries. But the pace of that change could mean that some energy businesses fall foul of the regulators. I'll find out how after the break. Energy companies are powering our homes, our businesses and our imaginations. But to do that, they need to stay on the right side of the regulators. In the UK, the energy regulator is Ofgem. They monitor the energy market to ensure fair treatment of consumers. And to do that, they have strong enforcement powers. Andy Burgess is associate partner for the Energy Systems Division at Ofgem. He joined the regulator in 2008 from the Office of Rail Regulation, where he looked after European policy. Andrew's also chair of the European Regulator's Smart Grid Coordination Task Force. When it comes to demand-side response, what's the digital innovation that, that's really motoring that side of the sector? The, the biggest innovation is software and the ability to do things in real time without people having to worry about where and when they're, they're using energy. And what we're seeing is more and more independent aggregators and other, other businesses coming into this space and making life easy for businesses by developing software and developing technology, which means that the businesses can so concentrate on their own commercial timescales, their own commercial deadlines, um, and leave an independent entity to manage their energy use and save them money overall. Another area we're seeing a lot of digital innovation is when it comes to infrastructure maintenance. So are the regulators offering any incentives to, to businesses to, to, to help them along the way? So that applies to um, all the network companies, the companies that run the pipes and wires and the people that manage the system. Um, they have a network innovation allowance, which is a pot of money they can spend on innovative ways of solving different problems. We also run an annual competition so that network companies in partnership with third parties such as universities or, or startups even can bring forward ideas which could benefit consumers and can get consumer funding to develop those ideas where they can benefit the system. We also have particular mechanisms to try to avoid a traditional bias towards investing in infrastructure when there are smarter ways of doing things through storage, demand side response, flexibility, more active network management. And we're starting to see a real change in the role of, of, of those companies and the way they act. And that should decrease consumer bills over time. Where do you see the role of monopoly networks in this evolution? And where does digital innovation fit into the bigger picture? So we want the monopoly networks to harness the benefits of smart technology, new ways of doing things, but essentially they are buyers of services um, and we're saying that they should be neutral market facilitators. What we don't want them to do is own storage and operate storage or own some of the options they're having to weigh up because then immediately people start to think there's a conflict of interest or, or there isn't a level playing field. A level playing field is exactly what big players like E.ON want. That's difficult to achieve when they have to satisfy regulators wherever they supply the consumer. In all the markets that we operate in, we will obviously work directly with a local regulator. So there isn't really global regulators in that sense. It's all pretty much actually decentralised down to the local governments. In some cases, actually regions as well, depending on which country that you're, that you're operating in. So we'll be working with the regions or with the governments to ensure that we're complying with all the necessary regulations. And what impact might that have on your digital solutions? 
So I think that actually quite often you find that digital innovation is ahead of the uh, of regulatory changes. So we're always uh, keen to work with regulations, try and bring it up to date with what's happening in the in digitization. So if you can imagine, if you're if you if you think into the future. Um, and you look at something like blockchain. Now, blockchain is a totally decentralized system of being able to, um, tran let's say, transfer value between different parties without a central entity. So it's quite interesting. I mean, who's going to tax it? Who's going to be uh, regulating those, those interchanges between the different, uh, different people? So when you look at some of the changes in, in the actual technologies, you find that actually regulation will have to probably adapt to catch up. I mean, we see that already in different industries, like what we've seen with Uber in London. One of the challenges for us is obviously to be aware of what's out there. Um, so we've introduced an initiative called the Innovation Link and a regulatory sandbox. We have initiatives where people with ideas who are maybe hitting up against some barriers in the industry can come and talk to us and if necessary work with us about how they can get their idea into the energy sector and into the market uh, and maybe we can um, derogate from some of the rules that are there. And that helps us in understanding what's out there, and it obviously helps them to see how they can navigate their way through these sometimes tangled um, industry rules that you find in the energy sector. Sky Futures isn't regulated by Ofgem, but James Harrison doesn't take his obligations any less seriously. When it comes to the Internet of Things, you just think, gosh, there's loads of data out there, and we've got to keep that data safe. So what do, do you do to, to make sure that that data is protected? I think in any B2B environment today, you have to be security first. You have to absolutely think, what, what could happen to us? You only have to look at people like Yahoo, mass data breaches and the kind of damage that makes to a corporate. So for us, everything is security first. You know, we are highly paranoid about what could happen. And so we look to the, the newest cutting edge technologies to make sure we stay ahead. So by using different cybersecurity initiatives, we can look and see if someone tries to do a mass download of data if it's an employee or someone with the access permission. So we take it a, a step further and so that's how we start. And because we work with the biggest companies in the world from day one as a startup, which is pretty unusual, we had that drilled into us from the very beginning. It's fascinating to see this drone at work, even though it's just another tool gathering data, like our smartphones, like our tablets. The key to how all businesses will operate in the future will be how they interpret all that data. And I'll find out how they'll do that after the break. New technology is driving business forward in ways that few could have predicted a decade ago. And that innovation is changing the digital economy, and business is embracing it. But what about the wider world? What are the implications of this new technology for society as a whole? When you look at the energy sector, I mean, we're being impacted by a number of areas. One is the, the whole push to decarbonisation. And I think that, that's an amazing opportunity for energy companies to really help the planet, help the environment and, um, and actually help support customers decarbonise. Um, we're also looking at decentralisation. So decentralisation is, is that we're not having huge generation in a central location. It's moving more out to the customers. So customers that are producing their energy, it could be a customer that's putting solar panels on their roof or having a battery in their, in their garage, to a, uh, a business customer who's producing energy for their business activities, but they don't need it at certain times. So they can then just push that back into the grid. So overall, we're looking at a, a future where the grids become a lot smarter. The devices that are sitting on the grids that, that are cons either consuming energy or, or actually producing energy like a, um, a CHP, a combined heating and power unit, can actually decide when they push energy back into the grid um, so that it's maximizing the, uh, the efficiency of the consumption uh, of, of, the, of energy at any time. And as you look into the future, what is going to drive that? Is it going to be artificial intelligence? Is it going to be machine learning? Is it going to be a combination of everything that you're already using to some extent now? So I think uh, definitely machine learning, artificial intelligence is, uh, is definitely the, the buzzword. It is the, one of the very interesting new technologies that's, that will allow companies to actually change the way that they work and apply smarter algorithms to their assets, um, their, the way that people are working, in fact. So if you look at a great example would be is, is that um, when we're running our wind farms, we want to be able to maximize the energy that we're able to produce from those wind farms. By actually using artificial intelligence, we're able to manage each 
individual turbine on, a, on an individual basis. So they're all maximizing each other. They're kind of talking to each other to be able to say, right, actually, you need to sort of offset yourself a little bit so that I get more energy or produce more energy from the wind in the, from the turbines that sit behind it. So, I mean, I mean, it's tough to say it's very, very cool stuff. Um, and um, it's just a, for us, it's a technology that we want to use to try and improve our business. Will it be customer expectation or the availability of the technology at your fingertips that's going to drive digital innovation in the future? So I think it's, it's both. Um, customer expectations are increasing all the time. The way that we run and, and manage our lives is becoming totally connected. Um, and ultimately, I think everybody's expectations keep increasing, ratcheting up all the time. Um, we're so connected in our day-to-day -day life that um, you know, that's just become a, a, a norm now. And in companies that can't adapt to that or can't provide those same levels of service, they fall behind. Um, and that's something that we really need to avoid. For the king of the drones, James Harrison, his focus is on the gadgets that capture the data he'll use in the future. So it's interesting. We're here talking about drones and the Internet of Things, but it's actually not just drones that, that are really changing the Internet of Things. So we've got clients now that don't even use drones. right? So we've got clients that are using cameras, they're in GPS-denied environments, and actually we can take that data and put it through the software and it works in exactly the same manner. We're linking it all together so they can visualize their asset. So if you've got, if you're doing a tunnel, for example, um, you can recreate a 3D model of that tunnel and you can tag where exactly the anomalies are. If a subcontractor needs to go and fix it, they can just log straight in with the permissions, see it in 3D and go, I know exactly what I need to go fix. They take the right tools and they get it done in an efficient manner. So that's also what we're kind of working on as well. So it's, it's not just drones, it's your smartphone, it's your helmet cam. Everyone is a data collection device. You know, anyone who wears a, wears a hard hat for work in the future will no doubt have a small camera on which is continually inspecting their work site. It might suddenly see a problem that they're about to walk into and via a smart glass tell them to stop. It's unsafe to proceed any further. That's where we're, we're going now. A lot of what you're talking about is, is technology that we've got at our, our fingertips now, um, but that is being used by big corporations, big energy companies with, with big budgets. It sounds like in the future, it's the technology that's going to be able to be applied to organisations large and small. Absolutely. I think you need to focus on the big companies because they're the ones who actually pay for this development. And actually, as you've already heard, they're the ones who save lots and lots of money today. If you've got big infrastructure, big business, you can save bigger line items. Um, that then translates down as the technology matures and hardens, everyone can then use it. Um, from the person who just wants to have a look at their own roof, they don't even have to do anything. It might be a community drone that just flies around and looks at everyone's, everyone's roofs when the, when the sun is shining, and when the, when, when the wind is really you know, uh, hardly moving. So they'll choose the best possible time to capture all this data, to, to interfere uh, or to not interfere at all with, with people and, and just get on with the job. So you'll never know it's happening. These things will just happen on their own in the background. So where do, we, where do you see your business in 10 years' time? So we'll be the key enablers for this, for this whole market. So we want to kind of be sitting in the background, enabling all these businesses to do incredible things and to make everyone's life much more efficient and to bring down the price of energy ultimately. It sounds like all of this technology is going to have an impact on society as a whole. In what way do you think that's correct and that your company is going to play a role in that? Well, similarly, in terms of the Industrial Revolution, took people from you know, hand weaving things to, to machines doing it. Everyone thought, oh, my goodness, we're going to be out of a job. And you had the Luddites smashing up the factories. This is another revolution towards AI. So I think what we're seeing now is that people are worried about, oh, my God, I'm not going to have a job. I'm not going to be able to you know, create my inspection reports. Actually, one engineer will now be quality assuring 20, 50, maybe 100 reports a week. Um, and using that expertise absolutely where they need it, rather than spending their time and focus on things that actually a computer can do much better. So I think it's, it's creating much more highly skilled jobs um, and, and making things more efficient and maybe enabling us to do much, much more. 
In the energy sector, supply and demand is everything. Increasingly, Internet of Things devices are being used to gather the data to manage that supply efficiently, to maintain existing infrastructure and to give the businesses using it the best deal. That digital innovation is powering growth in economies around the world and if it continues, it could help secure a cost-effective energy supply in years ahead. IOT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric.